The Stars series Vida um, tells the story of two sisters against the backdrop of gentrification in a predominantly Latinx uh, neighborhood. And the show's second season uh, premieres later this month on Stars. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby, and I'm here with the uh, creator and executive producer of Vida, uh, Tanya Soracho. Tanya, now that season one is is behind us, and now that you're on to season two, what's been the reaction uh, to this show uh, that you've heard, not just from the Latinx community, but just overall? So my big temperature like stick is Twitter. <laughs> Right. I mean, a lot. That's why I engage. Uh, I engage with a lot of people I don't know, you know, in my everyday to day life. And that has been for the not for the most part entirely as, as I've witnessed it positive, especially um, people think saying immigrants, queers, brown queers, not just Latinx queers, you know, saying that it's representation uh, um, like they've never seen themselves represented, um, uh, reflected that way. That was, I mean, I knew we were doing something true to life, but like to see, to you know, to see masculine of center butches be like, I've never seen a brown masculine of center butch, you know, that is not, um, uh, you know, two dimensional for a comedy or something. Um, a lot of times, um, Latinx queer characters are, um, are sort of the punchline, like, like they were like comedy, you know, like a uh, relief or something never fully fleshed out. Um, and so it, to, you know, to have, uh, you know, and it was only a really sh short season, right? Like it was like a long pilot, but um, to have at least like the beginning of, of, of some deepening of, the, of these characters, I think that I, I think that that's why we had a good reaction. Um, I, I, I've had a lot of really great conversations about like, just, um, and I think, um, my friend Gloria Calderon's show has this too, like the way the show looks, the texture is also part of that um, representation. And th there's something about, I feel like the dominant culture doesn't, um, doesn't have, uh, um, has never experienced the alchemy of recognition. So, so like you see, you know, uh, um, a butter container with uh, that has beans inside of it. Like it's a very Latinx thing, right? That's super Latinx. But like we don't explain it. It's happening in the middle of the scene, you know. Um, um, in the first season, like Emma is serving herself from a container like that, and um, those moments are the moments um, that a lot of people say, "Oh my God, I grew up like that." Oh my God, you you see me, and, and it just becomes a like a, a we exist moment. Oh my God, I exist. I am seen, you know. And um, that has been. But I knew it was going to happen because I was making it sort of for that. But like, um, I didn't know how big the reaction was going to be, like how, uh, you know, people were going to react about that. Well, and and you see, the the word representation um, seems to be one of those you know zeitgeist words, but it really is important because for so long. Um, people behind the scenes aren't even representative of the communities at large. And so when when this show came to you, uh, Stars actually pitched it to you, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, so with that opportunity, did you go into this really with uh, a mission mo beyond just telling a really interesting, uh, good story? Well, because I, the truth is I never thought we were going to, get this far i don't know if i have that like <laughs> like when i start a project i have like a failure mentality which protects me because like we just keep going kind of like a video game okay i want that level all right we're still going you know um it, so i just wanted to tell the most truthful story about these two sisters and the world around them so i didn't think i i, I mean i'd never been a showrunner before um so i didn't even think about a, a director yet or a, you know anything like that until it was time and then it was like oh i have a big opportunity here to open this door and just let people pass through meaning dp my D, my dps are female latinas you know all my editors are are, are female um half of them are latina um and then all my department heads are female all my directors are latina this season like after after realizing, oh my gosh, I I have hiring power. Um, that that will also dictate how we um, create the world because we, we like all those eyes and ears 
and opinions and points of views create the world, you know? And when you have, you know, the same thing creating the world, it, it just, it, it just become. I hate the word authentic because that reminds me of like a Mexican restaurant, like authentic Mexican <laughs> food, but a true to life world, you know? So yeah, that, that then I realized, um, oh my gosh, that's a lot of power to let people in, you know? Um, same thing with my all uh, Latinx writers room. A lot of them were, it was their first job. Um, Cause then, then it became not just about what I was making, right? So the content, but it became about how we were making it. Um, so that became kind of like a parallel political, um, social political act, you know? And and so so now that you've you've have you wrapped season two or yeah. are you okay so it's wrapped so going from season one to season two what did you go into season two wanting to explore that uh, that you didn't get a chance to explore in season one that I couldn't explore the first um, season um, yeah. yeah well that was like a three the first season was like a three hour pilot <laughs> in a way where we barely get the, at the end, the last moment is we get, we, we get that handshake. Well, they don't actually handshake. They pass the tequila um, bottle to each other and they, they're like, all right, let's do this. Let's uh, basically carry on this legacy. Uh, and let's get to know each other. Cause that's what they're saying too. That's like, let's go into business together and let's get to know each other as family too. So, the, but it takes six episodes to sort of get to that. Um, and so now six, season two, which um, starts um, May 23rd, all episodes drop, um, which, I, and we we built it thinking of that. Um, now the story really gets going. Like that that's that's the easiest way to, to, to say it. Like everything we sort of set up, it just sort of just starts um, starts going. You know, the, uh, the all the obstacles, the, you know, getting to know each other, because uh, those girls have not been together for like over a decade. So they actually don't even know each other as adults. That you know, there's a lot of vices that they have to deal with, a lot of like bad habits, and now they have to deal with each other because like they're sort of tied to this building. Um, we had this um, consultant. Um, these consultants uh, that are bar consultants do a business plan for La Chinita for the bar, and we followed the business plan for story. So what would the girls have to do really to lift it? And I'm telling you, Tony, they would. This bar would. I don't think it would like. I think it might fail. You know, it's. It would take five years before they start like making money because of all the debt they have. Um, but that's great story. Like I love showing going almost not quite real time. Not a lot of time passes between the two seasons. It's nine days between the two seasons, and then. The, the episodes they go very like the, the time between it was like a day um so you really see it in real time oh my gosh this is gonna they, they have no money how are they gonna lift this bar but that's like story it was like yeah and conflict and obstacles you know it was um we just i think we only got to like phase two of this business plan and and included in that of course is the sister's relationship with eddie which took a, a really interesting um tragic in one sense, but also ended on a really hopeful, talk about that, about that storyline combination, because that's really not something you see, um, you were saying earlier, you know, seeing a, a, a more, you know, queer butch woman, uh, also being strong, but yet also delicate. Uh, the relationship between them is really one of the focal points of season one. And so what can we expect with that going forward? Well, that continues because we start the season with Emma feeling so guilty um, uh, about that. She expressed it at the end of the season when she was like, she said, I now for the first time she imagined her mother walking hand in hand in the neighborhood with her wife. Now, Emma's queer. That, that She doesn't call herself that, but in practice, she's a queer, you know, she's a pansexual person, you know. Um, and, and and that's something that sort of got, got um revealed in a, a, a throughout the season and you're like wait is emma being a hypocrite is emma being queer is she out you know um and it's complicated because her relationship with her mother so in a way eddie becomes proxy or like a stand-in for her mother but also they have their own relationship um emma and eddie have an interesting relationship because I, emma does feel a sense of, of well of guilt and also of loyalty to another queer and especially after this has happened especially after she maybe have like made this happen by kicking her out. Um, so she starts a season like like that, like, do, you know, 
I guess she's also my responsibility. She knows that Lynn and Eddie have no money, that Eddie is broken, literally broken ribs, uh, broken hip, you know, um, and that they're her responsibility. And that's sort of how Emma looks at the world. Like, you know, what am I responsible for? What do I have to achieve? And it's like, heal Eddie. That's what we have to achieve. But then at the top of the season, there's a little complication that, um, that like sends everything up, you know, in the air. If, are they family or not? It's like, that's the big question. And it's sort of the season redefines what is family, you know? And, and queer content, you know, on television is still, in many ways, despite all the gains, is still somewhat limited. And, you know, when your show won uh, the GLAAD Award, uh, what, what did that mean to you? What, what did that mean to you, particularly for this particular show? And, and also, it's, um, and the queer representations that we have are oftentimes very white and or male too so so in that in that regard we haven't seen a world like this you know um it was amazing because we, we were this little show nobody nobody knows who i am um you know my, my kids I, I say kids but my cast <laughs> i feel like um my cast is just starting out too i mean we were, were um you know super talented super able but like no i didn't have any big names you know uh in the in the cast so to be I hate the word recognized, but to be seen, you know, to actually be seen um, for 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 what we achieved that first season, that was everything. You don't understand. Like we were beaming for days, like geeks. Like we we're totally, totally geeking out about it. Um, it felt great because the shows that were nominated are all shows we watch and we respect, you know. And um, and there's just something about the dominant culture because you know a, a a lot of Glad is also you know uh, steeped in dominant queer culture to be these brown kids to you know, and and um and to be given the award it was everything you know it was it was really exciting so what what do you think it's going to take i mean we seem to be in a shift in the industry right now where you know there's certainly more outlets for people to tell uh, more diverse stories but what do you think it's going to take to get to the point where we're not so much saying oh here's finally this representation or here's finally this representation uh so that you know, everything is more like just, oh, there's, there's that. What, what is it going to take to get past it where it's a, it's a special thing that needs to be pointed out? I think, you know, I, I, this is cyclical. I'm just going to speak for Latinx, right? This is cyclical. We've had like one gain and then three losses, one gain and three losses. So in decades, we like make some progress and then it kind of goes away. I, I, we just lost one day at a time. I, I don't know how much progress we're making. It seems like like we're we're trying to make move like we we're talking about making uh, shifts, but like eleven Latinx theme projects were developed um, this past broadcast season. You know, this not one got on the air. Um, they, they they pilots that were made and stuff. I I, I don't I, I don't know if we're, we're really even there. You know, right now like that we're make up. 18% uh, of the population, and there's only like four or five Latinx theme shows right now, you know? Uh, well, Jane the Virgin just left, but like it, it that, so I don't know, because a lot of people are very kind of self-congratulatory about like, oh, you know, the change, it, we, you know, things are changing. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I feel, I, I feel like we have to wait to see if we are um, uh, in a moment or having a, an actual movement so that we don't have to, you know, like what you said, like, so that we can just tell good stories with you know um people from marginalized communities you know people of color people with disabilities you know um queer people and not have it be a thing you know but right now we don't have enough access like if we had 18 percent of the show on television you know latinx and if black Amer americans had 12 percent of the shows you know on television then okay yeah now we just get to tell our whatever you know story we get to tell but so much of our stuff has to be you know the ambassador, like our show is the first Latinx themed prime cable show. They, and there are a host of problems that come with that, right? We have to train an audience to come follow us and pay just to watch us on a, on a cable, you know, uh, network. It, you know, a lot of brown uh, millennials, they watch um, streaming now, right? They don't pay for cable. So like, and we are on a cable network. So like, it's like, 
sort of creating the model too. Um, and stuff that I swear, when I was writing the pilot, I didn't think I was gonna have to be worrying about, you know what I mean? Like, great, we made it and we made it well. We made it right with all the right people below the line, above the line. Now will people watch it? Oh shoot, people are not watching. Are people watching it? You know, um, it, it especially especially because we didn't have any names, and I'm you know it was first time showrunner, and like I said. Well, now that you, so, my last question is is with the political surroundings that we have. How much of that do you allow to seep into the show? Does it just seep in naturally? Is it something that you purposefully want to include or exclude because some people don't want to go there? How do you deal with the surroundings that we're in socially and politically on the show? The moment we're like the political moment that we're having right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have, like I said, the creators, so like the, the writers. I'm the creator, but like the people who like sort of nurture the world and build the world are the, these Latinx writers. Most of them are queer, all except one are women. They are married to uh, women who are DACA. They are um, formerly, uh, you know, un undocumented uh, 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 spouses. Like we, we have skin in the game. So we don't even, um, I don't know if you noticed, we don't deal with, um, with it like all overtly. It's not like a, PSA. It's not like um, this is learning television. Now we're going to learn about, you know, whatever issues are happening. We're just living them, including me, the showrunner. I am not a citizen. You know, I am I'm a citizen of Mexico. I have a green card. And um, all of us had skin in the game at different levels. All of us have different fears of what <laughs> of the current climate, you know, but that should be. And I don't know if you've seen any of the second season, but like that should be that's embedded in the texture of the world. You just see it. You see people's and the buttons they wear, the the jokes they tell, the um, there's a you know like it, it, there, there's a joke that Eddie Eddie's in the hospital is like man they want all my Obamacare dollars and just just by that you you know you, she doesn't have to explain her political leanings you know um it, 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 there's a Trump piñata <laughs> you don't they don't say anything against Trump we don't say anything against Trump there's a Trump piñata that's it you know um and so it it, it just becomes um part of the world because like when we're walking around Boyle Heights, that's how it is. It's not, you have a really politicized character and she wears her stuff in buttons and she, you know, uh, La Chinche Mari, she, you know, she protests and she, you know, she's in the resistance, but the rest of the characters are just living their brown lives, you know, in this neighborhood. Because our writers uh, are living their brown lives in the city. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, very excited for season two. Uh, premieres May twenty third, I believe. Twenty third. All episodes bingeable drop May twenty third. All right, uh, uh, Tanya Saracho, congr congratulations uh, on season two. Uh, best of luck, uh, everyone. Please uh, subscribe to Gold Derby, uh, like this video, and you'll see more chats with the tastemakers of Hollywood. And uh, log on to goldderby.com so that you can make your predictions in Emmys, Tonys everything entertainment. Uh, Tanya, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tony. Bye.